right. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hopefully, <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> musical intro, Rodrigo. Hi, everyone. I'm going to let a couple seconds for everyone to file in. I hope that woke you up, whether it's morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. But in the meantime, while we're waiting everyone to come into the room, go ahead, find the chat, drop in where you're calling in from, how many TNN events you've been to, and if you've been to Columbia before, what your favorite part about it is. We have a very interactive presentation today with Rodrigo. And I'm just gonna let you guys connect for a few seconds and, and say hey to each other while I go ahead and introduce myself. <laughs> I'm, yes, I am representing <laughs> my Columbia jersey. Very excited for this presentation. Um, this is the national team jersey for people that don't know. It's a fake one. Don't worry, I got it for like 10 US dollars. Probably couldn't afford a real one. <laughs> but I'm Leah. I am a TNN event host and I am the leader of the LA chapter. And I'm also the creator of the Ticket to Anywhere travel podcast. So super happy to have all of you here today. And while you're chatting it up in the chat, I'm going to share my screen and go through a few housekeeping items, especially for those that haven't been to a um, Nomadic Network event before. So like I mentioned, um, this is a Nomadic Network event, computers loading. <laughs> We are a global community of travel enthusiasts started by Nomadic Matt at the end of 2019, and we were going live in 22 plus cities around the world and connecting with each other, supporting each other, teaching each other uh, how to travel for longer, better, cheaper, and, you know, just sharing our love of travel in, in bars and restaurants everywhere when we could, you know, be around each other. Of course, we pivoted to virtual events once the coronavirus all put us into lockdown, which is actually kind of cool because now we can run more events with more people around the world. Um, like Rodrigo is in Bogota right now, like he's not even close to me. So we can catch you whether you're at work or on, in a hammock in, in a tropical paradise. Um, and we do have different kinds of events. We have these speaker events where someone presents and then we do a Q and A at the end, which is what today is. Uh, we have book clubs, which is once a month. Our next book club is next Wednesday, March 3rd with David Farley. And then we have super casual happy hours, which are really fun. You don't have to live in that area to attend these happy hours. You can just connect with people wherever you want. They're really fun, really casual. We play games and get to know each other. Usually talk about a lot of our favorite food on travels too, which is nice. <laughs> So a few things to keep in mind. Thank you. If you have your camera on, we love to see your faces. Um, you don't have to have it on, obviously. <laughs> you will be muted. So please use the chat to drop your questions um, in the chat and please uh, start it with the word question so I can pull it out and Rodrigo can answer it later. So we're here to have fun. And Rodrigo's doing this because he has this amazing travel company that he wants to let you know about. And um, the knowledge that he has to share with us about his beautiful country. So we're very grateful for that. And if you're interested or anyone you know is interested in the TNN replays, we invite you to become a Patreon member. You can head to patreon.com or you can scan the QR code and you'll see the bulleted list of all these amazing perks that you can get becoming a Patreon member for the Nomadic Network and Nomadic Matt. So, um, with that being said, I just want to let you all know that Rodrigo was born and raised in Bogota, still in Bogota. Um, you know, after college, he started backpacking, exploring the world, but realized that Colombia has so much untapped potential and then started his own amazing travel company. So Rodrigo, I'm going to hand the floor over to you and you can let everyone know more about um, Colombia. Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be here and thanks everyone for keeping the camera open. It's, it's great to enter a community and to see faces because you know in these days usually you just see like black squares all around so it's great to see everyone. I see that Mark has a background, is that Bogota Mark uh, Peterson if I'm not wrong? Yeah, I think it's the top three, it's where I live now. Okay, cool. Um, but I've been so to uh, a Cartagena before, really amazing place. Oh, cool. Yeah, lovely, lovely place for sure. 
Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm going to try not to talk about much about my company. I talk about my company all the time. And since this is a more intimate uh, event among travelers, and I'm a passionate traveler myself, I'm going to be talking about how travel changed my life and how changing my life through travel uh, we have been changing with Impulse the lives of thousands of people in Colombia using travel as a tool for social transformation. So I'm going to be talking about um, probably about 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Um, it's going to be interactive. And to start with, I just wanted to, to get to know you a, a bit better. And I had prepared some questions for you. So please be aware of your screen. I'm going to be popping up the first poll right now. And... The question is, have you been to Colombia before? Um, yes, no, or yes, I'm Colombian. I know that there are some people from Colombia here. Uh, some of my team members, friends, colleagues are connecting here. So we are filling in the surveys. It's 40 people connected and we're reaching almost 40. Oh God, you're fast. It's 37 answers. Just give me a couple of seconds till we end the poll and we throw the results. Right, so I see that. 80% of you have not been to Colombia yet, which is which is great. I'm going to be um, talking about the perspective of a, of Colombia from a Colombian who has worked his way from already 12 years in travel industry. Uh, for those who are Colombian, bienvenidos, parceros, un gusto tenerlos acá a todos. Ahí veo gente de mi equipo. Um, and for those who have been to Colombia, thanks for having been to Colombia. Actually, we need you here and every traveler is a great opportunity for this country to move forward. Um, I'm going to be going deeper into that idea later. So I'm going to share the second one. Um, wait, I'm not an expert on this. Okay, right. So this one, I, I just need you to promise that you're going to be completely honest and you will talk from your heart and from your gut. So when I say Colombia, you say, right. When I say Colombia, you say. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. Okay. It's like, a, it's, <laughs> oh, it seems like a race between the different bars that I'm seeing in my screen. So it's 42 people connected, 36 answers. I'm going to give it a couple of seconds for those of you who haven't filled in your answers yet. And we're going to see what is the number one thing that all these audiences Colombia is relating Colombia with. Um, right. Okay. We're done. And poll results yeah here we go great coffee oh thank you so much that narcos was not number one it's number two okay i get you i get you i i tried to see narcos i have to be honest i tried to see narcos because all my customers were talking about narcos and i was so it was so frustrating because this guy is not even colombian his accent is not really paisa so so you know it was like uh, you know, i just ended up like watching uh probably a uh, breaking bad or something like that um <laughs> so yeah coffee as you know colombian coffee is a huge thing not only the coffee the quality itself but it's also um uh or uh, nomination of origin so it means that colombian coffee is actually a brand uh, sadly, most of the quality coffee goes to export that's changing gradually and the coffee has also helped the social transformation process um, in a very dramatic way. And we also see Shakira. Yes, she's Colombian for those of you who think she's Mexican or from the Middle East. She's Colombian football, of course. Uh, Leah is wearing the jersey. If you come to Colombia and you wear a jersey, you're going to have and you wear the jersey of the Colombian national team you're going to have the doors open to you everywhere. People love football and especially the national team. Uh, Jay Baldwin, yes, he's getting big, right? And he's Colombian. And of course, peace, 5% uh, of you. Um, and I would say peace for sure. Right. And uh, the number three, um, now we're getting serious. Now we're going to talk about travel. And I want to know if travel has transformed your life. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Right. So we're 35, uh, 38 out of 30, 43 people connected, 39. I'm just going to give a couple of seconds and here we go. Right. So, wow. Wow. We see that we have here an audience who has been transformed by travel and 
that's amazing because I think you can really relate to the story that I'm going to be sharing with you. A bit, yeah, yeah. It's also nice and not quite, yeah. I mean, some people travel just for fun, not for transformational purpose, which is great. Um, keep on traveling. And if you do that, you'll, you, you'll know that you go from not quite to a bit and then from a bit to absolutely when you become an avid traveler. So with that, I'm going to be sharing my presentation um, that I put together, especially for this audience. Um, I hope. Yeah, this is my Spotify. Actually, we have great playlists with impulse if you want to look for them in Spotify. Um, right, so I'm going to be talking about travel as a peace building movement in Colombia. Um, just to start off by sharing a couple of pictures of what a childhood in Colombia was like. Uh, I grew up in a country in war, like all the fellow Colombians that are connected here and all this generation. And seeing these kind of pictures in the news was relatively normal. I remember this was massacred, perpetuated either by FARC or paramilitaries or by the military. It's, it's the same. I mean, the war only has victims. And it was normalized to see all this suffering and in the news. And it was, you know, I was a kid when I started to see these images. I was a kid when um, I saw these images recurrently. That was a teacher putting duct tape on the windows. Anyone can imagine why duct tape on the windows of the classroom? Uh, no, it was not a football ball striking the windows. It was actually um, the threat of a bomb. Um, the year I was born, 18, uh, 1989, there were more than 100 terrorist attacks, uh, mostly perpetuated by narcos. So when I was a kid, the windows of the classroom used to have uh, duct tape in case it was a bomb, the, 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 the class wouldn't come and, and attack us, right? And that was pretty normal, also pretty normal. I mean, for those of you living in Washington, DC, I think this is a common image right now, <laughs> like seeing the military in the streets, but we go about our daily life and we have like militaries heavily armed in the streets of the cities, which is, I mean, military is supposed to be like fighting for the nation, but that's not the truth in Colombia. Well, they are fighting for the nation in a way, but it's kind of normal to see military everywhere. And I remember having recurrent nightmares about my dad being kidnapped by FARC uh, or by any other art group. This is a picture of Medellin. Um, and just outside Medellin, this is a group of, of, of paramilitary group, right? So I remember like all these memories and of course we're in gap, but I mean, I wouldn't say it like I suffered uh, because it was very normalized, but at some point I realized that I had a lot of fear for my country. I had a lot of fear for my fellow Colombians. And I thought that the only safe place that it could be was like my home or my school or the shopping mall. And the rest was like a black hole of danger. So I started traveling when I was very young, thanks to my mom and dad, they were avid travelers as well. And traveling to Colombia started my own healing process. And I'm gonna share this story with you. Yes, I'm this guy on the right. Uh, uh, a lot of the things, have, you know, I, grow, I grew a beard uh, since then. Uh, and I must have been like, I think 13. Um, that's my younger brother, that's my dad. And that was one of my first trips to this beautiful place in Colombia called Cocuy. Um, and that's a national park with the snow peaks, beautiful place. And I remember that after being guided by this amazing guide, who, he was very humble, uh, like from the countryside. And after that, my dad said that in a conversation he had with him, he learned that he was involved in a guerrilla group uh, before. So I was like, how come? I mean, I would imagine like all the guerrillas are bad and, you know, with scars on their faces and they're like these thugs. And this guy was, well, he was such a nice guy. And, and, and I understood that it's not about the people, it's like a phenomenon that is going on. So this is the start of how traveling has started to change the stereotypes and change my fear for my own country and for my own territory. And, you know, it, it was not a surprise when I started to realize that travel started to move from my passion into being a project. So this is a picture of my first office. Um, yeah, that was my laptop and that was my desk. And that was a picture on the left of me and one of my first customers. Uh, I used, I started guiding in Bogota, my hometown, 
when I was in university, I was only this guy, since I spoke English when I was young, they do, anytime there was a foreigner, they were like, hey, Rodrigo, you take this guy to Andres Carneres or to the city center or to wherever. So that was very natural. And, and, and what started as a passion, I started to, to, I started to make a living out of that. And then we started scaling and evolving. And I started gradually in understanding the special aspects of the culture of Colombia, like the music, like the coffee here on the right, and building experiences based on this culture and the things that are unique to Colombia that are accessible and that it kind of breaks the barriers for travelers coming to Colombia so they can go deeper in their experience. So that was uh, a lot of years of building tours, products, guiding, growing the team. We started to grow. We got recommended by Lonely Planet. We were big in, uh, in TripAdvisor. And then 2016 came. And that was when, after three years of negotiations with FARC, which was the major guerrilla group of, of 10 million people strong, they finally struck an agreement with the government. And uh, the agreement had to go to a referendum, which is basically asking the population, like, do you agree with the agreement that we have achieved with FARC after three years negotiating Caravana? And of course, you know, I was the, the golden opportunity, right? This is the end of war. This is the moment for reconciliation. Without this guerrilla, everything will go great. And basically the conditions of the agreement were something like this. If there's someone who works in politics here, they can slam me because this is a very simplified version of it. But let's say something. Let's say uh, we ask Colombia whether you agree to finish this 50 year old conflict that has left more than 10 million victims and giving FARC two seats in Congress for and forgiveness in exchange for truth and reparation. It means that they wouldn't be going to jail and they would incorporate into political life as a political part, as a fast track to being a political party, right? And um, just a small hint, which is important, the direct victims of war have said yes already. So the victims were part of the negotiations and it's, it was very important for them the part of exchange for the truth and reparation. So um, some of you might know what happened, but I, I love that a lot of you have not been to Colombia yet. So we're gonna make a poll here and we're gonna run again the referendum, okay? So I'm gonna sh be sharing the poll again. Please vote for, the, for Colombia's peace agreement. So Colombia's peace agreement, nomadic network. Um, do you agree, my dear nomadic network, with Columbus Peace Agreement or no? Okay, let's fill in your votes. Okay, it's 22 out of 41. Um, 30, okay, I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna end the poll. One, two, and three. Great, what everyone expected, peace agreement done. Okay, so, but the sad story, it was that that was not the case for Colombia. So after the, after the referendum, we started to see like these kind of headlines. Um, sadly, the referendum didn't pass uh, and that was heartbreaking. That was heartbreaking because the, the main political party who was in power, it's very right wing was, well, they're still in power, they're not supporting the peace agreement. And um, there's a lot of interest. I'm not gonna go into that. I'm not gonna come here to talk about politics, but the fact is that the peace agreement didn't go in the poll. So in that moment, I was so heartbroken. And I was wondering if going to the polls, you know, this is, that's the thing with democracy. You love it when democracy works in your favor, but you hate it when it doesn't. Uh, and in this moment, I hated democracy. I was like, what can I do if going to the poll and putting an X on a paper didn't work? So I started thinking like, why can I do as a travel entrepreneur? You know, I saw like travel so far away from the actual thing happening on the ground in the communities. So um, that, you know, after that, the president back then, he run it through Congress. He made a couple of things here and there. I'm not going to go into detail, but two months after the peace agreement was actually signed. Um, but this moment was enough for me to wonder what is my role in being the change that I want my country to have. So 
some months after that, I got introduced by um, a friend and colleague who is connected in this call to this guy. He's Jaime. He was a gangster. He had been the leader of a gangster for a lot of years. He went to jail. And after jail, he came out of jail with this idea of transforming his life for the sake of his kids. He was recruited when he was only 11 years old or eight years old. And he, most of his family was, was killed in the drug war. And, uh, you know, he, he, he has a very interesting life story and he had his own ambition to start working in tourism. So I got introduced to this guy. It was his idea to work in tourism, not mine. And I started working with him in 2016, building this tour that is called Breaking Borders, which is this story of this community that has survived a very violent war and they're now transitioning to a more peaceful place. And it's amazing to see how the murder rate of this community dropped from something like 100 a year to zero after tourism started. So I got to this to understand this and is that a lot of suffering can be avoided if we were more intentional with the way we travel. And I want to share with you this picture. And that was when tourism was taking off. You see that Jaime is right there sitting just below the logo with a group of travelers from Impulse. And that has been the golden opportunity for this community to reinvent themselves and to stop killing each other. So um, talking about suffering, you know, with, with the previous message about a lot of suffering can be avoided if we just were traveling more intentionally. I, I'm going to be quoting Yoda, uh, my, my master. And um, so Yoda says, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. So I'm going to break this because Yoda was like this, I mean, the theory of change of impulse, it's all based on Yoda teaching. So if fear equals suffering, according to Master Yoda, and we can agree that empathy is the antidote to fear, and I think we as a travel community, we can agree that travel fosters empathy. That's the number one thing for travel, right? So if you follow the math, then we, we got to the conclusion that travel is the antidote to suffering, right? And that's only, I mean, that's Yoda's word interpreted in a different way. And this is the conclusion that I got in this moment. And that was the idea that put me in this journey of transformation, not only for transforming myself, but transforming other people and thousands of Colombians right now. And it's conscious travel, conscious travelers are the lifeblood of a peaceful, of a peace building movement in Colombia. Let me read that again. Conscious travelers are the lifeblood of a peace building movement in Colombia. So, I'm going to be using a metaphor here so you can follow me because I'm going to be talking about you guys. I'm going to be talking about the travelers that are coming to Colombia or that want to come to Colombia or that are dreaming to come to Colombia or maybe you haven't, but now I hope that you're put it on your list sometime. So uh, number one, uh, we're going to be thinking about a movement as a physical body. So we're going to have like these three components to a movement. It's the blood, the muscles and bones, and then the heart. So once again, the blood are the conscious travelers, then the muscles and bones are community-based initiatives that I'm going to be talking about later, and the heart, what's the heart? That's the impulse experiences. So I understood our role related to the role of travelers, and all these things have to be there and have to be working uh, well and working together for a movement to happen. So with these three things in mind, I'm going to be talking about you guys first, about the blood. So the blood is, you know, again, a doctor would slam me and would say like, oh yeah, it's much more complex than that. And if there's any physician here, please excuse me. This is just an example, but just bear with me for a second. So we can think about blood as bringing oxygen, nutrients, and healing and I'm going to talk about how you travelers can bring oxygen, nutrients, and healing to this movement. First, the oxygen is the motivation. There are so many communities doing the right thing. And in the moment that 
they start noticing that travelers all across the world and going to visit them and taking their tours and then getting interested in their transformation process and not about their violent history, not about whether they were drug dealers or not, not about you know how to make cocaine or all this kind of nonsense, but really interested in their life story and the way that it has transformed and the decisions they have made to emerge from this violent past. That's the best motivation. Just to give you a very brief example, there's a community-based enterprise in Medellin that is called Union Latina. Uh, they basically have a dance school for youth uh, to prevent them from engaging with violent activity like gangs and drug trade. So this dance school, they all these kids dream with being international artists. They dream with traveling abroad and being international artists. But when we bring travelers to this community, they become international travelers instantly. They don't have to travel to the world because the world is traveling to them. So when they perform in, st in front of international audience, they are fulfilling the dream of being international artists. Second one is nutrients, is cash, is the, the money, honey. That's important. And that's very crucial about where you're spending your cash when you're traveling. And in the case of Colombia, if these nutrients go to the right place, we're gonna be fighting the war against the drug-based economies. This is a picture of Don Juan Antonio. He's a leader of a project called Cacauteros, and they basically are trading the coca crops for uh, cacao crops. And that that he's holding in his hand, if you didn't know, that's a cacao kernel. Uh, yes, that's where chocolate comes from. And the experience that they have done is about engaging travelers in the process of chocolate and this way travel is bringing them cash to be able to substitute where base economies like growing coca leaves which is the raw material for cocaine and then we have the healing parts and the healing are the white cells so some people do a lot of healing when traveling especially in colombia and the white cells in our case of impulse are the domestic travelers and that's our case that's a picture of, and that was only a year ago that's me in the far right of this picture and that's in a place called Kawan. Kawan was the stronghold of FARC um, actually the most malicious uh, part of the FARC was in this territory was heavily bombarded the most terrible war breakout in area and after peace agreement a group of them decided to start a rafting operator. So I got to visit them last year. And for me, that was completing a circle because I was basically going in a river in the same direction and putting my life and trusting my life to a rafting guide who in some point of my childhood was this imaginary threat to my life. So that completed a circle and that's healing. That's hardcore peace building. And we're connecting these kind of initiatives to bring together two sides of the society that are broken. And also there's a lot of healing with, I mean, some of you are uh, traveling to Colombia can be oblivious to all the history, but some of you can also heal from different life stories that happen and they make a full circle when having these kind of experiences. Then I'm going to be talking about muscles and bones for a second. Um, and these are the, these are the heroes. These are the great guys. These are the people in the ground who are making the impact possible. And here we're talking about peace building grassroots initiatives, impacting communities and creating conditions for peace. I'm not going to go one by one, although I would love to hear every single story. We also were already talked about breaking borders, which is right here in the right in the center. We already talked about this chocolate right here, Don Juan. We already talked about rafting for peace. This is the dance school that I just talked to you about. These are the rafting guides. And like these stories, there are hundreds of different scores across the territory. And Impulse has been working with them and to con and connecting them to the travel industry, bringing the lifeblood, bring bringing the travelers the motivation, the cash they need for making these projects to be successful and to thrive. And finally, I'm going to talk about Impulse and the Impulse as the heart. Uh, why the heart? Because we're pumping blood. And one thing about the heart is we are also a muscle. So we are also a community-based project. It's a community of of change makers that are that believe that tourism can change the reality of a whole country and 
we take this thing of the heart very seriously. Uh, so seriously that heart is the framework, is the DNA to the experiences we build. H stands for human-centered. We know that everything is about the human interaction. And it's about how we see ourselves as humans and not as productive units. And also how we see travelers as humans and not as a cash. And not only as cash coming to our, I mean, the interaction between travelers and locals is always a central aspect. The second one is the economic opportunities. As I said before, the cash is so important. And to have the resiliency these communities need, they have to, they need to have opportunities. And these opportunities need to be economic. There's not a way to make a movement with an empty stomach. The A stands for authentic experiences. So we never put anything on a stage. Everything is as it is. It's raw, it's real. It sometimes is not uh, what everyone expects of dresses and you know the indigenous with the feathers and all that. They just put that up for tourists. We don't do that. We just like things as they are. Regenerative storytelling, it means Something very powerful about the hard experiences is that all these people find in, in, in the tours and in telling the story in a different way, it's a mean to reinvent their future and to give a different meaning to their past. So when the communities are having a storytelling that is empowering them about the social transformation that they're going through, and that's what they are repeating, it's like a commitment that they're repeating over and over and over. And also it's changing the stereotypes of people around the world. People who travel to Colombia are regenerating the stereotype and we need you guys in the world to see us differently because if you don't see us differently and if Narcos is still the number two thing that comes up after uh, when thinking about Colombia, that's what we're gonna be for the rest of our history. Top quality, again, it's impulse. We do everything top quality. We make sure that things are on time, sanitized, fair payments, um, you, you, you get what you pay for. And we make sure that the experience is always very meaningful and, and all the conditions are there for, to, for you to enjoy. I'm just gonna be talking briefly about this example. This in, in Community 13. This is one of the community-based enterprises we work with. It's a collective of Africa, Afro-Colombian artists. They do hip hop and urban music. And what they do, their impact strategy is basically engaging youth into art to give them a dream and to avoid them for engaging into illegal activities. Very similar to the dance group that we saw before. We run a tour with them. It's called the Afro Tour in Camino 13. Camino 13, some of you who have been to Colombia might have heard about this place. This is another area of Camino 13. This is not the famous escalators with all the shops and things. This is the, the like the real, area of Community 13. And this experience is personally one of my favorites. And this is what the reason that I want, why I want to bring it up. And Rafting for Peace, once again, that has been very impactful for me. These two guys that you see in the picture are former combatants. And being with them and interacting with them and spending three, three days with them and listening to their stories was really for me understanding that every conflict has always two sides. And in my personal story, I always believe one side and never question the other side. But after being there and sharing with them, I started to realize that there were no winners, no losers. There was not the right band. There was not the wrong band. It was only a war that has to be finished and that all of us are humans and we all need a second chance. So this is just to share with you the, uh, I feel very proud about having engaged 20 community based projects into the experiences with Impulse. And we have all through our history connected 2,240 travelers with these community driven projects. And we have generated $54,000 in direct income for these communities. That's a lot. A dollar can go very far and you, and you never underestimate the impact of a dollar in these kind of communities. And thanks to this, I'm very happy to share it with you, those who are in the team, we are still in the celebration mode. Last week, uh, for all the work that these amazing communities have done, this is not impulse, again, this is a whole movement composed of travelers, composed of uh, the community-based initiatives and impulse, which is the heart pumping. We all together got this recognition from the UNWTO, which is the travel division of United Nations. 
as the startup that has made the largest contributions to peace and social justice worldwide. So very, we're very happy to, for that and all the recognition goes to the community-based projects and for all the travelers that are believing and marking part of this movement. And just to end with a thought, um, since you're travelers, um, think about there are many invisible movements going on anywhere I travel to. What role do I want to have in this movement? Thank you. So before you leave and before we move to questions, I just want to take this chance to make a quick uh, announcement and a quick promotion. We are going on our flagship trip, Sounds of Colombia. That's a seven day fully immersion trip into the cradle of Cumbia. Uh, a lot of you have heard about Cumbia. So this is the music gender that has taken the world and we're going to go right there when it was originated and learned from the masters. They're going to be opening their doors to their houses, to their communities. And they are music masters, most in their 70s, 80s. Most of them have traveled the world, filled stadiums. And this is a great chance to go to their communities, to their houses, and to share this deep cultural and transformative experience with them. So I'm going to be showing this quick two minute video. I hope I'm sharing audio, but just to make sure, I'm just going to stop it here and do it again. Just one second. Okay, yes, sharing sound. Here we go. Ophelia tenía un platico, Ophelia tenía un platico, era de lo más brilloso, y Rafael el goloso se lo rompió. That's the trip. If you have any questions about it, you can just uh, reach out to us on our social media. Um, actually, I just forgot to share here the last part of the presentation, some contact details. Um, yeah, where are we? Okay, Zoom bar. All right, so um, these are the contact details. Uh, feel free to reach out for me directly for any question, any inquiry anything you feel like. Uh, this is the uh, Instagram holder, Impulse Underline Travel. And uh, you can also find us in LinkedIn for those of you who are part of the travel industry. 
and want to learn more about what we do and the updates and the work that we're doing with impact and travel, uh, we're always posting new stuff on LinkedIn too. So thank you so much for your attention and for being such a wonderful audience. Uh, I miss a lot of the conversations in the chat. I'm going to be updating here and I'm going to uh, pass it back to Leah. Oh my goodness. I think I can speak for everyone, Rodrigo, when we say that video made us want to go to Colombia like an hour ago. <laughs> Literally, some people in the chat were like, I'm looking up flights right now. I was like, wait, no, let's go with Impulse Travel. <laughs> so, wow, what a presentation. And thank you for some of the history and the changes that um, the country has gone through, you know, before and after the deal. And then how you came through, lived your life, and how you've made um, an impact on travel, especially starting your company. So, um, we got a lot of great questions in the chat and a lot of people were filling in the chat with their experience as well. So that's great to see. I have a little tip for everyone who hasn't used Zoom much before, or this is your first event. If you're on a desktop and you want to save the chat for whatever reason, recommendations, connect with others, there's three dots in the bottom right-hand corner. Click the dots and hit save and it will save to a Zoom folder on your computer. And this only works if you're on desktop, not on mobile, unfortunately. So, all right, let's get into some of these awesome questions. Um, let's see, let's go with uh, Laura's first. She wants to know more about impulse travel. Can you give us an idea of how many people are normally on your tours, how long most of them are? Um, I want to add to that, like how curated are they by the guests or is it like a big surprise when they get there? What is it like? <laughs> well, we started running walking tours. That was our origin, uh, walking tours in Bogota with very small groups. We That hasn't changed. We operate for small groups only. Most of the things we run are private. We don't have uh, set departures really. For these kind of trips, like the, the longer trips, like Sounds of Colombia, or for other longer trips we're doing to the Amazon, we're putting out dates and for people to sign up. Usually these groups are about eight to 12 people. Uh, Max, um, we do, I mean, our, our bread and butter is having people who want to come to Colombia and contact us and we plan a whole itinerary for them and we include all different experiences and we make hotel recommendations. Uh, we also do the uh, domestic flights and every, we, we, we take care of all the experience within the destination. But we also, if you go to our site, you will see that we also promote the experiences separately. So most of it is just um, private. If we have, you know, in high season, sometimes we have like two couples going in the same experience, the same day in the same language. So in this case, we make it a group of four with a guide, but that's usually not the case. Usually everything is run private. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, you brought up the Amazon, which is great because Alex actually had a question on, you know, how about a conscious way to visit uh, the Amazon or if you said Impulse also has trips there as well? Yeah, yeah, we're working with, so one of the things that the pandemic brought is that we're getting so close to our co-operators. Uh, there are many amazing travel companies in Colombia that have built their expertise and their relationship of over years with local communities. And there's this company owned by a friend and he has spent his life building relationships with isolated communities in the Amazon. They're not uncontacted, of course, but they're very isolated. And it's, uh, I, I actually just went on a trip with him in January and that was, that was really, really deep and really amazing. So we, are, we have other three dates coming up this year. Uh, it's a three-day trip to the Colombian Amazon. Uh, the group is usually from six to 10 people max. Um, and if uh, there's anyone who's interested, you can just reach out to us on our either LinkedIn or, you know, the easiest for us is just email and you can go to our website and fill in the contact form. That That's the easiest way to, to reach out to us. Awesome. Cool, Alex. Alex says, Please thank do. You. The, yeah. The trip Very is cool. really, really amazing. Um, 
Uh, actually, if you if you look out for my, you got four people, five people. Okay, let's do it. If you look for my, I'm gonna put here my personal Instagram, and here you will see it's one of my my latest posts. There are ten pictures of this trip in the to the Amazon, and you or anyone in the audience can just feel free to reach out to me uh, directly on on Instagram. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, no worries. Oh, and I believe it looks like you have a coworker in the chat as well. Uh, yeah. We have a rafting for peace tour in the Amazon. I think it's a coworker. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the uh, yeah, it's the Amazon. Let's 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 say it's it's part of. It's not technically the Amazon, but it's bordering between the mountain range and the Amazon. That's where the transition goes on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we have rafting for peace. Uh, we are also announcing groups for the rafting for peace. And if you have five people, and if you can do both, wow you will be, I mean, you will have like a transformation that you haven't seen in your life. These two experiences Aww. combined are. That's really so great. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wanna get back into some questions about Colombia in general and then your experience. Um, when you first started guiding and giving tours, um, I think anyone that lives in a big populous tourist destination feels the weight of what you had to do in college, but like, were you accepting payment? Were you using something like couch surfing? Like until you got impulse travel up and running, was it just like, you know, you doing this all for free? <laughs> no, well, as I said before, sometimes there were like friends of friends coming and right. they were like, oh, go with Rodrigo. He's going to take you and, and then see the city. And I, I used to do a lot of couch surfing. So I hosted, I, I also surfed. And for those, of course, I didn't charge. And I still show around people and friends and I still show them around without charging. Uh, but at some point, of course, that became something that I put on the internet with a price tag. And I started to make a living out of that when I was in college. Yes, that's great because people will pay for it. You're already doing it. And you know people value that kind of thing. So they're willing to like invest in it. A trip to Colombia is an investment yes. with people who know what they're doing. So good for you. <laughs> Um, what is the sentiment of locals towards travelers who, who mean well and do well when they visit Colombia? Like, do they feel it's overrun by tourists now? Obviously there are the tourists and travelers who aren't so respectful, I mean, but it's absolute love. It's, it's amazing. And, and we get it over and over with our travelers. And when, when we make surveys after travelers come to Colombia and we ask travelers, what was the most important, what, what was the most special part of your trip? And consistently we get people. So, and those of you who have been to Colombia can either deny that or support that, but it's really amazing to see how, I mean, we have been so close to tourism for generations and generations that seeing people coming is like a victory. It's like, oh yes, we're worth it, right? So. Of course, there are some areas in the country where tourism has not developed uh, the way it wanted. And we're starting to see some clashes between mass tourism and uh, locals. And that has been the case, for example, like Taganga or in some parts of uh, Cartagena that has happened, or even in Bogota, where there is, I mean, we're starting to see some areas with over tourism. But overall, I would say that people are very welcoming and very warm with travelers. Oh, that's so Especially wonderful. Especially have the jersey. So yeah, <laughs> actually, I remember. I mean, I've been in many a taxi in Colombia, but one one uh, driver had asked me. He's like, "How do you like my country?" And I'm like, "I love it. I've been here three months. Whatever. I'm obsessed. You know, coffee. I visited here, here, here." And he's like, "Good. Go home and tell everybody about it. <laughs> like, go home and tell everybody the good stuff about our country." So they come in, and you know give us more tourism dollars. So I was like, oh, of course I will. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, oh, that's so great to hear. Okay. Um, Kara wants to know, is teaching English in Colombia a big industry? Well, there are a lot of people that come and find teaching English as, and there are companies that are doing that, you know, people who want to volunteer and they can link them with different projects or schools and you know that's not really my industry yeah. um, but I know that there's a lot of people coming for for that yeah for sure yep and I think the same um 
in the chat, people are asking about like becoming a digital nomad there, which I think is a touchy subject <laughs> sometimes. Um, but I know one of our members, Catalina, is in Hardeen right now, which is stunning. I didn't get to go, but um, she's working from there. Beautiful. And it's just, yeah, it's, um, I think it's a, it's a good, it sounds like a great place that people can go and kind of settle down for a little bit and work remotely and, you know, give back to the local community while they're there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, I think both are, you know, people are going there to work, people are going there to teach as well. Um, all right, so let's see. I think it's Zimena. I think I pronounced that correctly. Zimena and a few others want to know what are, I know it always turns back into COVID, but you know, traveling times are different right now. So like, what are the COVID restrictions like, you know, getting into the country, but also what is it like when you're there? Like, are you guys using masks? Have you limited capacity? Um, you know, we're, we're living in a very different world in the US here and we still don't really have it under control. So I'm interested to hear what it's like in Colombia these days. Yeah, I have my mask right here. Uh, <laughs> And yes, people are wearing masks. Um, so the situation has been back and forth, like in every country, like at some point, like in the summer, everyone was out and for the Christmas Eve and celebrations. And then we have like a surge in the cases again, and very strict curfews and lockdowns once again, but things, the cases are going down once again. So the restrictions are going down once again. And I, I think it's like every country. Um, in terms of vaccines, uh, the uh, vaccines already started, not as fast as everyone would like to, but that's already underway. And the restrictions, it, I mean, I'm not going to go through a list of restrictions because they can change next week. But usually, uh, no quarantine of arrival. Uh, you are asked, uh, you're currently being asked uh, a test to enter Colombia. It depends on your country, you're going to be asked a test to go back. If it's the stakes, you at this point, you need a test to go back. Um, and uh, you don't need to do quarantine for, uh, if you have the test, you're cool. Um, the thing is that a lot of things are closed. Um, so if you were to travel right now, right now, uh, some things are going to be closed. I would just give it a month uh, because cases are going down and restrictions are easing uh, once again. That's really good that cases are going down. And I mean, I know you said the vaccine rollout was slow, but at least it's getting there. Um, mm -hmm. I know in the Philippines, like, I don't even think they have it yet. So my parents are from the Philippines, but it's like some countries are able to roll it out quickly because you have to purchase them, you know, it's a process. So, yeah. um, okay, very interesting to know. Yes, if you didn't know that, if you're leaving the US to come back in, you have to have, um, I believe a negative test. And if you're coming back to California or LA, uh, you have to sign all these waivers, pay a bunch of money, trying to discourage you from unnecessary travel still, so. Um, I think it's Linzu. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, but Linzu wants to know um, if there are any tours or you do anything with San Andres, the island in the north. Well, not yet. We don't have the connections and the tours set up. We, I mean, we've been 11 years in business. So one of our promise is that we don't sell anything that we know that we don't know very well. Although I've been to San Andres three times, we haven't done the whole work of setting up the operations there. So we don't have uh, operations in San Andres as yet. Okay, it's okay. Um, that will be amazing, I think. And there's like Providencia nearby-ish, nearby-ish. <laughs> it's a good um, diving spot, I believe. Um, yeah. So besides Bogota, Rodrigo, what other areas of Colombia are your favorites? Hmm. <laughs> you don't have to answer. You can just say the question? whole country. <laughs> okay, who is this question? Oh, okay. um, well, th there are so many areas. Uh, one, a place that is really, that I really connect very deeply is Medellin, because Medellin has been amazing in their effort to social transformation and they have been an example for 
many other cities, the social entrepreneurship in Medellin is just amazing. Uh, so this is the reason why I love Medellin so much. Uh, the Caribbean is so beautiful. Uh, Tayrona and Palomino, the beaches up there are just stunning. And the Sierra Nevada, which is this mountain, which is the, the highest mountain range close to the ocean in the world. And that place has magic on, of its own. It's one of these one of these chakras of the earth, like the Himalayas or like uh, any of these very energetic points. So this is a place that is really close to my heart. Also the Pacific region, Chocó department, uh, the Pacific meets the jungle. It's, it's, very, it's a very pristine place. Uh, infrastructure is very poor in terms of tourism. There are like very small lodges, getting there is very hard. You have to fly, there are no roads to access this part of the country, but that's part of the magic and the ancestral culture on all the uh, African connection to the ancestrality that is there is, is beautiful and the food is just second to none. And um, these other places, uh, the Amazon, I mean, I, I was recently in this expedition in the Amazon and I it was so special and it was so deep and to see like thousands and thousands of kilometers of jungle uh, that is pristine. I mean, there's no deforestation at all in this area where I went. And communities are so uh, original in the sense of the way that they live and their, the way to understand the universe, and the, the way to share it with travelers just for the sake of sharing and not really like expecting like a like something in return that was very transformative and the Amazon really got to a very special place in my heart. Oh, thank you so much. You just gave everyone a bunch of amazing ideas, but it's great to hear from, you know, a local who's still living there where else they should visit and especially with impulse travel. So um, thank you so much, Rodrigo. I do know I want to be conscious of your time. Everyone, I dropped Rodrigo's contact information for himself and impulse travel in the chat. If you want to look him up if your question wasn't answered. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer if you just reach out to him directly. So we loved learning about your company and how it's making an impact through Colombia right now and even a little bit of history and how we can uh, travel Colombia responsibly moving forward. So with that being said, I'm just gonna close out with a couple of last slides. And thank you everyone for, for being here. If you found value in this community, like I mentioned earlier, we invite you to become a Patreon member. So there are different levels of this. Um, it's, it's under Nomadic Mat, help support Nomadic Mat and the Nomadic Network. You'll get all the replays, uh, personal stories, uh, input on the content, live Q&As, all types of perks. So we encourage you to, to join us, uh, this VIP community, if you, if you feel that this presentation others have given you value. Next, uh, you'll see upcoming here, nomadicnetwork.com forward slash events. The events for the next upcoming weeks, we have them planned out, I believe until June. Today, there's a Texas happy hour. That's a new chapter. So if you wanna come join, welcome them. That'll be really exciting. I think they need the love after the weather the past few weeks. So it'd be nice to see some faces in there, but go to this link, find out what's happening till June. Next Wednesday, Book Club with David Farley is a really, really interesting book. Matt himself will be hosting this. So you can come with all of your questions and we're just going to chat and irreverent curiosity. So it wouldn't be the same if it was just Rodrigo and myself chatting about Colombia. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, tell all your friends about the next one. Thank you for being your questions, your enthusiasm, your love for this beautiful country. And we'll see you next time. Thanks all. <laughs>